Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. And if people trickle in a little later, that's fine. The first part is kind of just a background. So I'll just do a quick introduction. Hello from the US Army Women's Museum. My name is Michaela Procopio, and I am the digital educator for the Army Women's Museum here in Fort Lee. And I am presenting from here to over there, American Women in World War II. And this program is being presented as part of the Army's Diversity Weekend at the Army Heritage and Education Center, which is located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So uh, the Army Women's Museum, which is located at Fort Lee, Virginia, is actually located south of Richmond. So we're pretty close to the capital. And the Fort Lee base is home to the Ordnance, Transportation, and Quartermaster School. So if you join the Army for any of these, these schools, you're going to end up passing through Fort Lee's doors. And the reason that the Army Women's Museum is actually located at Fort Lee is because after World War II, all women that joined the Women's Army Corps were going to have to pass through this base. And so later on, it seemed like the perfect location for the Army Women's Museum. So we're actually gonna go ahead and move forward. And we're gonna start with this guy, right? So we're gonna talk about a program that explores the roles of women, uh, during the Army during World War II, and we're going to look at a couple of different women so that we can just see the wide range of diversity and variety of the roles that these women took on and what they did in service to our country during war wartime. So I always like to start out with this guy because he's pretty iconic, right? This is G.I. Joe. He is representative of all of the thousands of young men that are going to enlist and join up to fight for their country at the outbreak of World War II when the United States joins, right? So even though the war has been happening for a couple of years at this point, the United States joins after Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, right? So we're going to fight all around the globe. We're going to fight in Europe and in the Pacific. And later on, we will actually talk about how women got invited out into those roles as well, because we're gonna talk about the creation of the Women's Army Corps and where these women could be stationed. So we're actually only going to look at two branches today. We're gonna look at the Women's Army Corps, which was also known as the WAC, and the Army Nurse Corps which I'm just gonna touch on briefly because there are so many stories that we can go into. And the other one we have up here is the WASP or the Women Air Force Service Pilots. And I just like to include them very quickly at the beginning so that we can see that there is a lot of other branches in ways that women served, but the largest one, the one that we're gonna talk about today is the Women Army Corps or the WACs. And we're gonna start with one lady. We're gonna start with Dorothy Wise. So Dorothy Wise enlists in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in 1942. And we're gonna talk about WAC. And as you might've noticed when we saw it up there, it was only three letters. It was W-A-C. When it's initially created, it actually has two A's. And so it's the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And it's really important to distinguish between those because the extra A, that auxiliary, means that the women are only going to serve in the United States. They're not actually going to go abroad. They will stay here in the U.S. and will serve domestically. And very quickly after that, that A is dropped. The auxiliary is removed. And we'll kind of see that, right? So women are starting from the beginning, right? And we're going to kind of track this with Dorothy, which is why I like to start with her, because she is going to be one of the first women, like thousands of others, that are going to join the WAX when they right? And so shortly after Pearl Harbor happens, or after the attacks on Pearl Harbor occur, the War Production Board orders a complete halt to the manufacture of non-essential consumer goods. So the emphasis on the work in the factories is really important at this point. And so everything, everything that's being manufactured is gonna to come to a halt and is going to switch to defense production. And at this point, manpower, a shortage of manpower is going 
to happen, right? Because we're now joined the war. So where are all the men going to go? They're going to enlist. They're going to get called up. And this just leaves a really big gaping hole in our manufacturing. And so Dorothy is one of those women that signs up, you know, the iconic name like G.I. Joe, its female counterpart is Rosie the Riveter. And Rosie the Riveter is this nickname that is given to a multitude of women who go to work in the factories as part of this conversion to war production. Right? Okay, so Dorothy, when she joins the factory, she joins a subset of women called WOWs or Women Ordnance Workers. And so they're not actually WAX, right? They are the answer to this manpower shortage that I talked about briefly, right? So at the museum, we like to say that the answer to the manpower shortage was actually women power. So Dorothy is from Canton, Ohio, and this is really important because this is home to a major factory at this point, and it's home to the Hoover Company, which is making vacuum cleaners. When the war, product, war production board orders that all of this manufacturing is going to stop, the last Hoover vacuum exits the factory in April of 42, and they begin manufacturing defense products. About 70% of the workforce at the Hoover factory is going to be women. And so Dorothy is one of those women, which I kind of talked about briefly, right? And so up here, what we have is that iconic image of women, Rosie the Riveter. She's a wow, a women's ordinance worker. And I actually really love this picture on the left because this is Rosie, right? She's got a riveting gun. She's holding like a sandwich, you know, all American. And my favorite part of it is that she has her foot just resting on top of a copy of Mein Kampf, so Hitler's autobiography. And it's so just very like patriotic in all its details, right? This is actually an image by Norman Rockwell. And so then also what we have is we have this little newspaper on the left and it says enter Uncle Sam service. And what I really, really like in that photo is that the Hoover factory had their own little newspaper and it was called the Hoover Newsy News, which is just a great name. But it actually followed the stories of all of their workers who ended up leaving the factory to join the service. And so in this photo, we have two men but we also have Dorothy Wise. And so the reason that we know a lot of the stories about Dorothy is because we are able to track and piece it together from that newspaper clipping, from that newspaper company, because Dorothy does not actually share her story after the war is over. And so we've had to piece it together through newspaper clippings. So we're actually going to watch a short video, right? Because we're talking about the creation of the Women's Army Corps. And the Army recognizes pretty quickly how massive this war is going to be. And there has been a push previously to World War II for women to join the Army. It comes very heavily after World War I. It's pushed by a congresswoman named Edith Norse Rogers. And so when they create the Women's Army Corps, the Army and the United States government is very concerned about the perception that they're going to put out to the public, right? How are we going to reassure our public about what this Women's Army Corps is going to be? So this is a very short, it's about 30 seconds long propaganda reel that is made by the Army and the government after the Women's Army Corps is created. So I'm going to play that for you and you just see what things stick out for you. On every front, the men of America are carrying on our fight for freedom. And back of them is another army, a woman's army, the Women's Army Corps, the WAX. Women from every walk of life, of every race, creed, and color. Women who have recognized their stake in the future of America. They carry no arms and their work is far behind the fighting line. But for every WAC volunteer, another soldier is released for combat duty. Another weapon turned against the Axis. So I always really, really love that, uh, that video because it's just chock full of such information so shortly, right? It says women of every race, creed, and color, which is a very important line that sticks out, right? That 
this Women's Army Corps has been inclusive from the very beginning. And it's also very clear on what the women's job is. Their job is to release a man for combat duty, okay? So that's very clear to us, the roles that they're doing. They're going to be in an administrative, filing, cooking, cleaning, right? They will not actually hold a weapon. Their job is to take up these roles that are necessary to the functioning of an army, a military, and help the men fight so that they can end the war and come back home. Okay. So, right, this I talked a little bit earlier about that extra A that we have in there, right, the auxiliary that we see right up here on this newspaper clipping. It says W-A-A-C. Because the original intent is that women are not going to be sent overseas. They can do all of this domestic work from home. This is very quickly not the case. And it changes pretty quickly, right? The Women's Army Corps is created to serve at home, and they will only last the duration of the war plus six months. After that, no more. However, this changes really, really quickly when the Army realizes that they can actually utilize these women overseas. And so Dorothy is going to be one of those first wax that is sent abroad. I will like to point out, because this ties into our next woman's story, that this overseas assignment was not open to African American women. They are not included in this serving overseas. So Dorothy does her basic training in Fort Des Moines, and then she goes on to Cook's training in Florida. And so this picture that we have here at the bottom left, this is a Signal Corps photo of Dorothy. And the caption on the back reads, Wax trained for service at Daytona Beach, Florida to do many tasks now performed by Army officers and enlisted men, thus releasing them for field duty. Under the watchful eye of a mess sergeant, tins of oysters ready to be fried cover the table while cooks compete, complete the task of dipping them, 1942. So after Dorothy... Uh, finishes her cook's training at Daytona, Florida. She is going to be sent to Algiers in Northern Africa, which we see in this newspaper clipping. And then she is sent on to Naples, Italy. Actually, let's stay at this photo. And so Dorothy becomes a part of the 149th Headquarters Company, which is the first WAC company to be sent to North Africa during World War II. Right, so she's going to serve in the headquarters staff of General Eisenhower. She serves in Africa for quite a long time, but as we know how the war progresses in the Allies, the Americans are working their way up through Africa, through Italy. Dorothy will go with them to Naples, Italy, where she will serve as the head cook. And that is where she will finish up her assignment. She will stay in Italy. It's also known that while Dorothy was moved to Italy, a lot of other wax were moved to England and France to help prepare for the coming D-Day invasion. So Dorothy spends the rest of the war in Italy. It is during her time while she is serving that she actually meets her husband, William Chandler. And they later marry after the war ends. They return home and they are both discharged. Um, so Dorothy never actually talks about her experience in the war. She's very quiet. She never writes any memoirs, never shares her story with her children. And so the whole reason that we're able to piece together story, Dorothy's story is a large part from those newspaper clippings that I would mention. And so this right here is a screen grab of Dorothy's story that we turned into like a four minute video at our museum, which really like highlights her journey as starting out as a wow, a woman ordnance worker to whack, to being discharged, and really just curtails a lot of similar experiences that other women had. Now we're going to move on to the next slide. Okay. So we're going to move on to Dovey Johnson Roundtree. So Dovey is actually still a part of the Women's Army Corps. You can tell by the insignia. But we're going to highlight Dovey because she is one of those first African-American women that is going to join the Women's Army Corps when it is created. 
right? So I said the Women's Army Corps is created in 1942, very quickly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And at the same time that women are allowed into the Women's Army Corps, it also includes Black women. So African American women and white women are going to join the Army at the exact same time, which is pretty significant because this is not the case for their male counterparts. However, as you're going to see in Dovey's story, there is still lots of discrimination and desegregation that is important to note as well, right? So we can take both of those things with a grain of salt. We see that the army is being progressive, while at the same time, there are just still threads of desegregation that are woven throughout Dovey's story, like those of many others. So when the wax are created, they say that they will also allow African-American wax. However, there's going to be a quota, right? So for women that join the army, only 2% can be women. That's the total for the army in World War II. Two percent, all women. Of that two percent, only ten percent can be African American women. So the first class of wax that go to Fort Des Moines, Iowa, will be four hundred and forty women. Of those four hundred and forty, only forty of them will be African American. Dovey is going to be one of those first forty. Dovey is born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she's raised and really influenced a lot by her grandmother, Rachel Graham. And Dovey's grandma actually happens to be very close and personal friends with Dr. Mary McLude Bethune. And so Dr. Bethune is going to have a heavy influence on Dovey's life as well. Dovey enrolls at Spelman College and she graduates in 1938. With a double major in English and biology, she teaches for about three years before Dr. Bethune encourages her to move to Washington, D.C. and work for her. And so at the time that W is in D.C. and working with Dr. Bethune, Dr. Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt are really pressing for the creation of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, right? And so when that is passed, Dovey is going to be hand-selected by Dr. Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt as one of the first African-American women. Actually, most of those 40 WACs that are African-American are hand-selected by Dr. Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt. And so she has a close relationship with almost all of them. Dovey reports for training at Fort Des Moines, Iowa in May of 1942. So this picture here on the left, this is Dovey. She is second from the right. This is them being commissioned as an army officer after their training is over. During her time in the wax, Dovey attains the rank of captain. And she is actually personally responsible for recruiting the scores of African-American women for wartime army service. So uh, there's not a lot of African-American women, and Dovey talks a lot about this job that she had to recruit them to serve their country and what it would be like to serve as a Black woman in the Army during this time. This picture on the right is actually a little blurry, but I like to include it because this is the only picture that exists of Dovey with lunch with Dr. Bethune. And so we really get to actually see this close relationship that the two of them had. Dovey recalls that united by the war effort, the black and white women on the base forged an easy camaraderie but in the army as a whole, Jim Crow was alive and well. And so during her time on base and during training, Dovey risked court martial a handful of times by confronting her white commanding officers about segregationist practices, including colored only tables in the mess hall. That instance on getting those signs removed was the only time that Dovey was successful in her endeavors. Dovey's experiences of discrimination in the wax actually helped her decide that she was going to pursue law instead of medicine when the war ended. And that is what she does. So after the war ends, Dovey uses her GI Bill benefits to attend law school at Howard University, where she becomes a lawyer. 
There's actually a really funny story about when Dubby uh, arrives at Howard to sign up for classes and she says she's using her GI Bill and the person checking her in says, oh, is it your father's? And Dubby says, no. They're like, is it your husband's? And she says, no, it's mine. And they say, oh, is it your brother? And she says, no, it's mine. And they're like, that can't be possible. You could not possibly have served during World War II to get the GI Bill. She did actually, in fact. And so she shares this a lot later on in her life. Dovey is also famous because in 1952, she is successful in securing a landmark ban on racial segregation in the interstate busing travel called Sarah Keys versus the Carolina Coach Company. This is well before the incident that we come to know as the start of the civil rights movement where Rosa Parks refuses to give up her bus seat. Dovey actually wins this case in front of the Supreme Court, but only in interstate busing. So between state lines does she win this. So this is actually a precedent that is help set for when we see Rosa Parks refuse to give up her seat later. In the 1960s, Dovey decides to go back to school. She's going to go to Divinity School, and she is going to become ordained in 1961. And she ends up preaching at Allen Chapel AME Church in Anacostia while continuing to practice law. Michaela, I noticed that we're not recording anymore. I think we are. Hold on, let me check. No, we are recording. Okay, all right, okay. thanks. Um, oops, sorry. So Dovey uh, actually passes away at the age of 104 in May of 2018. Um, she's kind of left out of history and she does write two books. One is called Justice Older Than the Law and Mighty Justice, My Life and Civil Rights. Um, Justice Older Than the Law talks about her experience in the Women's Army Corps during World War II. I highly recommend it. It's really well written, but it is only a snippet. She does talk a lot more about her life in general. And then I like to play this clip for everybody because it just gives you a really good sense of who Dovey is or was as a person. So we'll play that. What is, your, what is your definition of leadership? One who is willing to give and to take measures to equip him or herself to lead. That means going, getting some education. That means doing reading, keeping up with your reading. It means beating the bushes on understanding of human beings. I always like that because you can tell it's very clear to Dovey that she really valued education and especially reading and how well that helped her in her life. And so the last lady that we're going to talk about today is Eva Mirabal, and she is a Native American WAC. She is actually from the Taos Pueblo uh, tribe in southwestern America, and we're going to talk about Eva. There's actually not a lot of information on Eva, and this is pretty indicative for um, our Native American wax and even our Hispanic wax as well. They're kind of tended to be left out of the story books. It's even harder to trace a lot of stories for African Americans. It really depends on the person, right? Like Dovey really chronicled her life, whereas Dorothy Wise never spoke about her experiences after the war ended. However, Eva is born on June 18th, 1920, and she was named Ihawa, which is fast growing corn in her Taoist language. And she attended the Taoist Pueblo Day School through the eighth grade and then attended the Santa Fe Indian School in 1936. And this is where she's actually going to receive most of her training as an artist. And it's really important, and I want to include it here, that prior to when Mirabel attended Indian school, Indian children were forcibly taken, had their hair cut, and could only speak English, right? And one of those kind of quotes that comes out of that was, save, uh, save the man, not the Indian. This is not true when Eva 
decides to go to Indian school, right? She makes that decision herself. The reform of education of Indian schools takes place in 1932, right? So Eva attends in 36. And Eva will say later on in her life that she used her time in the Women's Army Corps and as an artist to bring Native American culture to white America. In 1942, at her last year at the Santa Fe Indian School, Eva enters a national poster contest that is run by the U.S. Department of Treasury to help sell war bonds. The painting is on the next slide, and it was one of the three winning posters. So it's actually here on the right. This is the poster that Eva created and won. It says, Buy War Bonds. Both of these pictures are Eva as well during her time in the Women's Army Corps. Eva enlisted in the WAX in 1943, and she is one of over 40,000 Native American women who would join the Women's Army Corps and the WAVES, which is the Navy's group for women during World War II. And Eva is actually going to serve as an artist during World War II. Her ability to create art caught the attention during her time as a whack, and she was assigned as the only full-time designated artist in the Women's Army Corps. She was commissioned to draw a comic strip for the Air Whack, which is part of a newspaper that was published at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and that's actually where uh, oops, sorry. That's actually where Eva will spend her entire three year of duty during the wax. Uh, Eva is actually gains a lot of notoriety during her time as a whack, and it's not for an artist. She gains notoriety as an artist years later. She's actually well respected in the Women's Army Corps because of her appearance. And this was actually very, very important. Uh, to the army and to the government during this time. So there are lots of accounts that document that Eva was very trim and her uniform was always impeccable and her hair was always curled. And this actually catches a lot of attention and Eva is rewarded for her appearance. This uh, picture right here on the left is actually used as the cover of a magazine while Eva is serving as a WAC. When asked why she decided to join the WAX, Eva said that two of her friends and her decided we wanted to help the war effort, so we joined at once. And in this interview that Eva did, she didn't do very many, but she did a couple. Her interviewer was quick to steer Eva back to this ultimate goal of wanting to settle down and get married. And actually, Eva did receive three marriage proposals from men who were serving in the army during World War II, and she turned down all of them during the war. She cut off her interviewer and said, if you're talking about marriage, Corporal, that's out for the duration. We've got a war to win, remember? Eva was promoted to private first class and then soon afterwards to corporal because of her immaculate appearance, both with respect to her person and her bunk in the WAC barracks. She is actually going to accept a marriage proposal, but she accepts it after the war is over, not during. And these are Eva's comic strips. We actually know that she made more than two, but these are the two that are recorded in history, so we're actually able to see them. Um, I will kind of give you a second to read them if you want. I can read them to you. I always like them because it says, by private first class Eva Mirabal. Uh, you might notice that it is a different spelling. They did spell Eva's name wrong. It is actually B-A-L instead of E-L, but it is spelled uh, differently. You can also see uh, her change in rank from private first class to corporal. Eva's first G.I. Gertie cartoon was published in February 1944. So Eva creates this character called Gertie, and her kind of point in these comics is to undermine army rules. So the strip above was the second one that Eva created, so we don't know what the first one is because we know by rank that she was promoted to corporal. Um, and I like the first one because she talks about this whack has been granted furlough to leave uh, for her grandmother's funeral, but then her grandmother arrives. Uh, 
Eva also worked on murals, so doing a comic strip was not the only thing uh, that Eva did during her time as an artist. She worked on murals where she was stationed at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The mural that she was an assistant on called Bridge of Wings still exists in the building that housed as the headquarters. Eva was then invited to design and paint a wall mural for an October 1944 air power show. It was painted in Pittsburgh and it depicts the landing of airborne troops by parachute. It is still there. Eva musters out of the army on January 6, 1946. During her time as a WAC, she earned the WAC Service Ribbon, the American Service Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. And so after the war ends, Eva is given a position as an artist in resident at Southern Illinois Normal University. And she is going to use her GI Bill to become an artist. And this was all Eva talked about. She really, after the war was over, wanted to leave Taos Pablo and go train as an artist and really bring recognition to Native American art and culture. Unfortunately, Eva actually arrives back in Taos Pablo in July 1947 to take care of her mother who was ill. We don't actually know why Eva left. We assume that it's because her mother was ill, but she never says that's the reason, and she never actually returns to art school. So once she returns home to Taos Pablo, she will never really leave again and get her training as an artist. In December of 1950, Eva is going to accept a marriage proposal from her childhood friend, Manuel Gomez. Manuel, like Eva, also enlisted during the war. He enlisted in the Navy. And he actually stays in the Navy until 1965. And this is going to have a huge strain on Eva's life. He leaves her as a single mother because he is not stationed in Taos Pablo. He's actually stationed in Florida. So he's never home. And she is expected to raise two children while trying to remain invested in her art career. And so she's trying to balance motherhood with her dream passion while also supposed to be providing food and support and housing for her two children. Her son, Jonathan, is born in 1952, and in 1956, she gives birth to her second child, Christopher. Eva struggled continually with her marriage and her husband's absence and her financial struggles. And this takes a massive toll on Eva's life. So during the last five years of her life, she is in and out of hospitals, trying to get herself out of her struggles with depression and her struggles with addiction. And she passes away on August 9th, 1968 at, in her 40s. So she does not live very long. During the last five years of her life, we also see her struggles in the art world. So Eva had a really hard time navigating between the traditional and modern worlds. She suffered from a lack of money, her husband's military career, and a struggle with her identity. So this painting is titled Prairie Fire, and she did it in 1965. It is thought to be one of Mirabal's last known works, and it is the largest painting that Eva ever made. This painting is also the cover of the only book that we have on Eva Mirabal, titled Eva Mirabal, Three Generations of Tradition and Modernity at Taos Pueblo by Louis Rudnick and Eva's son, Jonathan Warm Day Cumming. And so we're actually going to move on to this, and I'm going to play a clip. It's about three minutes. And it's between Lois, who is the author of this book, and her son, Jonathan, a uh, warm day coming. He is also an artist himself, and he really talks about Eva's, Eva's artwork and what she wanted to have in the community, what she wanted her legacy to be as an artist before her life uh, was cut so short. So I'm going to go ahead and play that for all of you. And it's an Illinois University, and she said, as an Indian representative, I feel I have a very definite obligation in explaining and illustrating our art to American white people. Although most people overlook the fact 
American Indian art is the only true American art because it originated here. The type that most people recognize as American true art is really borrowing from some foreign land. I just thought, oh my God, that's so fabulous. It's just absolutely incredible. So after returning from her, um, her year as, and she's on the left sitting in front with her students, she... Upon returning to Taos, uh, she, she um, took advantage of the GI Bill. And at that time, uh, there was an, um, a school that was run by um, two artists, um, Louis Reback and Beatrice Mendelman. And they're also in this, in, uh, in this um, photo. Uh, at that time, we also have a couple of paintings which were shown at the exhibition that I had with her here. And there's a definite influence that she was going or, or, or partaking in this mod modernist movement. And one of this is a painting of her deer, but they were done in an abstract form. And to this day, I was down in, in Santa Fe with a friend not too long ago. And I think we went into the uh, Georgia O'Keeffe Museum or one of the museums in Santa Fe. And there was some art, but here again, her work was not in there. And I told my friend, you know, she belongs in this particular show. And she, because I think she, uh, a lot of her history was omitted because of the military first, and then because of her location here in, in, in Taos, we're out of the way here. And even to this day, I myself have kind of run into that because I'm, I'm not near Santa Fe. And if you want quick publicity, move down to Santa Fe if you're an Indian artist. You know, that, that's where it's done and stuff. And, and that's one of the reasons why I think, uh, you know, it, to this day, you know, uh, she's kept out of the, of the limelight while other artists are, 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 are being given this publicity. But I think her time is due, is what I think, you know, long overdue. But uh, she was a tremendous person, I believe, you know. She was a, definitely been a force in today's artwork as she'd been living, you know, not just in Native art, but in art. So I always really like uh, that clip because that is, uh, that is actually uh, Eva's son, Jonathan. Um, no, stop. Um, that is Eva's son, Jonathan talking about his mother's legacy as an artist you know how she returned to taoist that she still tried to paint and she did struggle with a lot of the things that i talked about earlier and her death in 1968 really prevented her from becoming more of a force but other reasons that he talks about her location and the military and so really this book that they're talking about was published uh just this past year. So 2021 is the first time that this book has come out. So we're actually at the end of our presentation. I talked to you about three women today, Dorothy Wise, who really chronicles a lot of similar experiences that American women had when they joined up. W. Johnson Roundtree, who talks about, you know, this progressive movement that the army is undertaking for a time of social change by allowing African-American women to join the WACs, but also on that same hand, how they continuously face discrimination and desegregation in a movement where the army was trying to be progressive. And then, of course, the story of Eva Mirabal, who is one of few Native American women who we actually have a story to tell, to share, and her time as an artist during World War II, right? So she's not even doing administrative tasks or traveling like Dorothy was or like Dovey was doing, but she's just trying to be an artist. And at the same time, we see that all three of these women are trying to undertake their own movement of social change and that they really believe that by enlisting and serving in the army during World War II was really a stepping point uh, to create more opportunities for women, but also for their own identity, their own backgrounds as well. You can find uh, quite a few more information about other women on our website. It's awm.lee 
www.army.mil. Uh, we are open to the public, so if you are ever in the area, please come visit. You will have to go through base access because we are on a military installation. If you uh, have a woman in your life that you know of that served in the army and you would like more research on her, we are actually home to the most documents and archives related to army women. So you can fill out a research request here. And we actually offer lots of K-12 programs, very similar to this one that I gave to all of you today. We also do programs for JROTC and training for soldiers. So uh, thank you for coming to this program today. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, using your time on this Sunday morning to come learn about some really incredible uh, women who served our country during World War II. I'm going to stop my share now. Thank you. Well, thank you so so much, Michaela. That was that was amazing. Hey, I, I've got a quick side question, a scholarship question. Do you got? Do you have a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, uh, you mentioned rank uh, with the uh, with uh, Dovey specifically. She had a captain rank, and and the issues she had on post dealing with uh, some of the segregation stuff. Can just for my own edification, my you know, when I'm teaching about, uh, I have a class I teach to some uh, to teachers about wax. Um, how did ranks end up working not only for for non-white wax but just women in general uh you know the ones that were a captain or a major or even higher than that did they find that they get a lot of, of pushback uh you know when it came to chain of command and such as yeah. far as a wo woman having a higher rank than a man in a certain situation yeah so um if you want more on that you can definitely send an email i'm just going to tell you what i know off the top of my head and it's not everything um women could have the same rank as men right we see that there were men who were majors and women who were majors however women could not obtain the highest level of rank they were actually cut off i do believe it might actually be major i think that might have been the highest rank that women could obtain at this point so same ranks not same pay uh the only African-American woman to actually ever achieve major is Major Charity Adams. She is actually also the only Black woman that is going to take a troop of Black women overseas called the 6888, which we also have more information about. And Duffy, not as much, but Charity a lot talked about her experiences as a major, particularly in relation to her having a higher rank with white women and her having a higher rank than some, than some men. I'm not actually sure when that changed. It, it is prevalent in World War II, especially. Uh, I know lots of white women who served as wax did have more opportunities to hit higher ranks than african-american women um and we also see that because more white women stayed in after the war was over there was a dramatic decrease after the war ended particularly in african-american women they felt that they had done their point to prove that they they were worthy and they just didn't resign um so it is something that is that is prevalent. If you want more information, just shoot us an email and I can provide you some documents or some specific people that did that. But I would definitely look in to Charity Adams because she does talk a lot about how rank impacted how she got things done, specifically on the base and in, um, in, in commanding white women as well. I hope that answers it just a little bit, but we do have information oh, yeah, on that. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. That that definitely whets my appetite for more information. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, unless anybody has any more questions, I will go ahead and end the recording and head out. Uh, you are also always more than welcome to send emails to the Army Women's Museum. We are also on uh, Facebook. Um, so you can check updates for that. I put the link to our website in there if you're interested as well about any of our of our programs, any research requests, anything like 
this as well. And I hope that it gave you a little bit more of a broad kind of range of the women who, who served during World War II. So thank you everybody for coming today.